All right, the recording is in progress. And we're good. All right, uh, let me open the meeting with a roll call. Thank you for coming to the Wednesday, June 16th Park Recreation um, Advisory Commission meeting. Roll call, Pam Weil. Here from Ingham County, East Lansing. Chuck Overby. Here from Ingham County, East Lansing. Alex Smith, you're muted. Yep, thank you. I'm uh, here from East Lansing, Ingham County. Adam DeLay. Sarah Hoover. I'm here. I'm actually calling in from Ross Common, Ross Common County today. Yeah. Woohoo! Okay. <laughs> <Yes. laughs> Nicole Biver. Hold on. Okay, here in Ingham County, muted. also East Lansing. And outside. And Sarah Rex. Hi, I'm here from East Lansing, Ingham County. Okay, that looks like a quorum. Is that correct? Even though we're yes, missing. It is. Okay, so. Just Adam. Adam had announced last month that he would not be able to right, attend. Right, right. I just wanted to make sure that Nicole just jumped on. I was a little concerned. Okay. So now we've had the approval of the agenda. Someone want to move it? So moved. Any I'll discussion? Oh, thank you. Any discussion <laughs> around uh, changing or modifying? H hearing none, all those approved as stated, say aye. 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 Opposed? Hearing none, the agenda passes. The approval of the minutes for our last meeting in May. Does someone want to move them? So moved, and I did read them actually. <laughs> I'll, I'll second it. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm with Chuck. <laughs> um, do we have any discussion, revisions, modifications, corrections? <laughs> Hearing none, all those in to approve the meetings as said, say aye. 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 Any opposed, say nay. Hearing none, the minutes are approved. Do we have any public comment, Justin? Yes, we do. Uh, currently have two callers in the queue. First phone number is ending in 177. You may unmute and address the commission. Hi. Um Am I on? Yes. Okay. Um, hi, my name is Arthur Slaboski. I live on Colorado Drive in the Northern Meadows neighborhood, Harrison Meadows neighborhood. Um, we're soon to get a bridge connecting our cul-de-sac to the trail. Thank you all. And this, I have a small request, and that's about how streets like mine have no outlet signs. And also in the same neighborhood, we have Brandywine and Cricket Lane that are cul-de-sacs for cars that also have no outlet signs. And I've been thinking about this for a long time, how that's no outlet for motorized vehicles. So now that I'm getting a bridge at the end of my street, this might apply to other places in the city that I'm not familiar with. I'd like for you to think of a sign that would indicate that this is a no outlet for motorized vehicles, but non-motorized users on foot and on bikes can proceed to the trail. It, it could at least be, you know, next to the no outlet, you could have a, a trail sign at the beginning of the block, but maybe there's something more creative. So I would just like these signs at the entries to such blocks to be less auto-centric. <laughs> and that's my comment. Neat. All right. I think that sounds very interesting and like a good idea. And 
Wendy, do you have, are you familiar with uh, anything like that? <clears throat> Um, I'm familiar with what um, Mr. Slabowski is re um, referencing in terms of the no outlet sign. I haven't seen one before that says, you know, no outlet for motorized vehicles, you know, access to, a, you know, non-motorized trail. But I'm sure there's something that we can work with our Department of Public Works to come up with. Those are road signs. And so it might be something that we need to look at um, a complementary sign or um, I'm not sure I can put two signs on the same post, but I can definitely work with our um, road department and DPW to see if we can do something. Yeah, I love that idea. And I'm, I really like signage. And maybe we look at just in general trail signage, like, like he, he suggested, which I really like, that the, the idea that maybe there's signage trail entrance ahead or something that, that will give people ideas for more exploring and that sort of thing when they go by. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you. And the next caller is phone number ending in 534. Phone number ending in 534, you may unmute and address the commission. Hello, you're on with the Parks Commission. Are they muted by any chance? I can see that you're unmuted on uh, Zoom. Uh, star six to unmute, please. You look unmuted, can you hear me? Uh-oh. We have a volume issue. Can you hear me? Oh, uh, we can now, Hello? yes. Okay, we all right. Um, this is Ann Hill at State by Luteo. I've got a couple of comments I'd like to make tonight. Um, regarding the email that I received from Wendy Longtree this past Monday, a couple days ago, asking for assistance because some hawk nest homeowners were dumping yard waste along the Northern Tier Trail. Um, as the president for the Hawk Nest uh, Homeowners Association, the Hawk Nest Master Deed and the bylaws, define the role, the jurisdiction, and scope of authority for the Homeowners Association. Uh, while we're currently willing to consider assisting the city with communications that affect the majority of the community to pursue addressing three or four of our 387 homeowners regarding alleged issues on public property, seems like something that is outside of our purview. Um, I did notice that Eli published an article on June 15th about uh, the new neighborhood resource specialists indicating that they are deployed to situations such as noise, overflowing of trash dumpsters, icy sidewalks, and etiquette at the city's dog park. Um, since our property taxes and more recently our income taxes are being used to fund these positions, it would seem more prudent to reach out to these individuals about this issue. Um, having said that, if there are issues that affect the majority of our community rather than a select few, please feel free to reach out uh, to us again in the future. Secondly, regarding the performance benchmarking report, Mr. McCaffrey noted in his presentation last month that East Lansing's population is about 48,000, which would include the student population that lives on campus in the MSU dormitories. When this benchmarking report was presented a couple of years ago, I seem to remember that MSU land was not taken into account, even though it's three and a half square miles inside the city limits that are available to the general public, as well as the students for their recreational and other use. If that is the case, it seems like it could be misleading in our benchmarking efforts to include the total population but not include total acreage available to the public. Even though it's not technically owned by the city, as a resident of the city and the state, we can use it for walking, biking, and other limited recreational activities. We're very blessed to have a community to have access to the vast amounts of green space on campus, as well as our city park system. Being a college town, I realize it's very difficult to compare communities nationwide with our city as the demographics are so unique. And any light that could be shed on what is included and what is not included uh, so that we can do comparisons in a meaningful and transparent way would be greatly appreciated. 
And finally, um, could someone direct me on where I can find a written procedure or a process by where this commission and the city staff obtain neighborhood input prior to scheduling work to be done in a community park, especially as it relates to capital projects and capital dollars? I've heard initial costs, funding sources, and occasionally useful life discussed, um, but not annual maintenance costs. The discussions, and I'm talking about annual maintenance costs with a capital project. The discussions I have heard have been before this commission uh, and the city council, but I'm not aware of how the local neighborhood is informed and able to provide input prior to these high dollar capital projects going forward to solicit grant or other sources of funding. Are pros and cons brought before the people who ultimately have to pay for them so a balanced discussion can be had from neighborhood to neighborhood within the city. I've previously asked at both this committee and before the city council for this information and not had any response. Um, whom should I be asking or does such a document even exist? Thank you in advance for any assistance you can provide. Okay, I wanna take the last um, point because it's one of my pet points. Um, the agenda for our meetings is published ahead of time, and I strongly recommend that citizens review those agendas and see if there's something that is relevant to them and something they'd like input on or have questions about. Um, and in terms of the benchmarking, um, because we do not have um, jurisdiction over MSU land that is not considered part of the city of East Lansing's responsibility. Um, I'm sure that you could find the square acreage of campus and, and do those calculations. And as for reaching out to the um, Homeowners Association, one of our members of this commission and made that recommendation, so maybe she'd like to make a comment. Yeah, thanks. Hi, Ann. It's Sarah Hoover. Um, I, I just had suggested that we reach out to you that maybe a communication could come from the HOA just reminding people because we do send out the newsletters. I'm um, just reminding people that they should not be dumping yard waste and that they should be bagging it in city bags and putting it out at the curb um, because it, it is impacting the storm drain and it may only be one or two homeowners. But if that storm drain gets plugged up, it's going to affect a lot more than than just the, the home immediately out in front. So that was my suggestion. Okay, and, uh, I, and I would suggest too that, that that practice has a negative impact on all of our citizenry, particularly citizens close to where the event is occurring, and that it's not necessarily the individual that we're talking about, but the community as a whole getting a heads up and that, that sort of thing. All right. Okay, so as the, as the email that I read from Wendy stated that this uh, offense had occurred on the Northern Tier Trail. So the Northern well, Tier no, Trail- Okay, so, so I'm gonna ask that, that we carry this on. Possibly you contact Wendy after this meeting to discuss it, but um, I think you heard our response and why you were contacted and what remediation was kind of being requested, which was not an enforcement issue or even an identification of the individual, but simply a communication shared in your general communication with your members um all yeah, right. i'm getting the distinct yeah i'm getting the distinct impression that this commission really isn't fun of people calling in uh and asking questions so i i'm uh, sorry you, if that's your impression you. because i am i am doing everything i can to get as much participation with um citizen participation in government at all levels particularly at city of Lansing levels and particularly in these meetings, I am advocating currently that we continue a Zoom um, access, even when we get in-person meetings to allow extensive as possible participation from citizenry. So, and I definitely appreciate you, your, you, your, your participation and your, your, what you know, you are definitely plugged in and I appreciate hearing from you, definitely. Well, I thank you for your time. All right, Recreation and Arts Program presentation. Take it away, Kathleen. 
Thank you so much. I'll try to make this as brief as possible, but warning, I am long winded. So if you guys just want to do like timeout or something, then, you know, I'll get the, I'll get the cue. So as long as there's a few songs. <laughs> you guys don't <laughs> want me singing. <laughs> okay. I am going to share my screen. And I am assuming you guys can see what I see right now. Okay, great. So um, I think I have met everyone because I was here presenting a couple of months ago about our Michigan Parks and Recreation Award. And so I am Kathleen Miller and I oversee uh, the Division of Recreation and Arts for um, our department. And those particular areas, in addition to all of us, Express Children's Theater, which we talked about um, a couple of months ago, is the recreation and arts programming. But I also oversee the worksite wellness program for the city as a whole as well. So we'll talk about that a little bit later. So starting out with recreation and arts programming, one piece of that are the fitness classes. And um, before COVID, we offered a variety of different classes and you can see them on your screen. Uh, Fitness classes have been for us very, very cyclical, as you, most of you know. Um, fitness can be very trendy. And so something like a Zumba class um, really reached its peak about 10 years ago. Some people still participate in it, but overall it's definitely on the decline. Yoga has been a bit of a stable for us and we continue to try to pay attention to what is trending and what we can offer. I always try to find instructors that are um, certified in particular areas. And so sometimes we're limited in what we can offer depending on license even of different fitness classes or certifications. One of the things we haven't been doing since COVID, which was it, which is offer pop-up fitness. So that's basically where we just send out emails or put on our Facebook, hey, we're doing this workout in this park at this time, please join us. And hopefully we'll get back to doing that soon. So how COVID has impacted our fitness programs, one of the ways it's been impacted is that we just stopped doing everything from, I think it was like March 16th until the beginning of July. That's when we felt we could start reopening to some outdoor options. And so actually one of the things we did between that time is I um, did some kind of um, workout at home videos and I put them on a YouTube channel and um, that lasted like about three months. <laughs> we tried to just try to encourage people to be as active as possible. We also did a Stay Fit EL promotion on our social media platforms to encourage people to just stay active and we gave them a series of different workouts that they could try at home. And then starting in July 2020, we started doing outdoor fitness and yoga classes and uh, here's an example on your screen of one of our yoga classes that took place out in front of Hannah here last summer. And then in the fall, we started doing um, a Go Ruck program. And for those of you that may not be familiar with rocking, rocking is basically you take your backpack, um, it's a military term, and uh, stuff some weights in there, what you feel is appropriate. And then you just go for a walk and it burns a lot more calories than just walking. And it can be a lot of fun. Sometimes we throw in different exercises and um, challenges along the way as well. I can't talk about fitness without talking about pickleball. Thank you very much, by the way, Pam, for that lead in <laughs> regarding Patriarch Park. So pickleball has been growing, growing, growing since we first introduced it here. I think it was about five or six years ago indoor. Um, we've been offering a variety of classes. Our classes are almost always full, um, as are the classes that actually wrapped up last night at Patriarch Park. Um, I'm sure Wendy has talked to you about um, what we're looking at doing in terms of revitalizing the existing courts at Patriarch. So that is really based on need. There's a tremendous group of people in the East Lansing and Lansing area who are really um, benefiting from the courts and also this is a really important intergenerational sport 
A lot of people that are playing it are retirees, but there's also a lot of families that are playing it because of the nature of the game. It is, I'm going to stop talking about it, but let me just say. Well, let me just say, not a non biased, <laughs> non player, um, really diverse group of people play in that class or whatever was busy going on. And I've been in Patriarch quite a bit, young dudes playing it, yeah. like college students couple of different groups of college students playing it too i'm just saying it's everybody seems and everybody was seemed so happy all these high yeah. fivings and yeah so yeah it's really it's very fun and so yeah if you haven't tried it let us know so another piece of what we offer is also our dance program in 2013. So about seven years ago we actually partnered up with Studio to Dance who had their own studio on Michigan Avenue but decided to close it um, because their building had been purchased by, and I can't remember who it was, but essentially the Lego building that's next door um, is what got put up and was purchased by the same group. And so they lost their studio. We decided it was a really great opportunity for us to expand our dance program. It has been a wonderful relationship um, because we've always offered Little Takes Ballet, which is basically not really ballet. It's really creative movement for three and four-year-olds. And this offered us an opportunity then to expand it through, actually, I think our oldest participant um, before COVID was in their 80s. So we have a full range of dance classes available. We just started back with some of those classes just recently, and we hope to offer on the back, the full range of classes starting next fall. So one of the great things I would love to talk to you about is our pottery program. <laughs> this is something that has been a part of our programming since back uh, well before when we were in Bailey. I want to say it was actually started in the 80s um, as part of East Lansing Recreation, Elbra rather. Anyways, <laughs> And then it came over with us when we collaborated or rather when we um, took over Elra. The pottery program and then when Bailey Community Center closed, um, we were able to find a space here at Hannah Community Center and uh, it was reopened um, because the program actually, I think was down for about a year until we were able to find space. We applied for a lot of different grants and we had some pottery sales to get money to fund the renovation. And since then, we have had a terrific response. Um, as a matter of fact, right now, all of our summer classes are full. Um, we are running them at below pre-COVID numbers because we obviously are still practicing some um, COVID restrictions. And so we're not filling those classes as, with the same numbers we used to. And space is a limiting factor. Um, we are incredibly thankful that Pam actually wrote a grant for us and got us some money to purchase some new supplies, which were really much needed, as well as a new display feature. And we're doing some other things so that we can do better outreach for the program. But um, space is just going to continue to be a limiting factor just because we you need lots of space and people need places to put their stuff <laughs> so we're hoping maybe someday we can expand that program one of the other things that we offered and i'm going to just talk about this in a pre-covid sense because since covid we have not been offering these classes again it has to do with space and also the instructors that teach these classes have not been interested in coming back until they feel it is truly safe. And that's completely fine with us. Um, we work with Sharon um, Griffiths Tarr, who is a very renowned and respected artist in the area. She actually does inter international commissions for her artwork. She's pretty amazing. Uh, her painting and drawing classes have always filled up for us in the past. I'm hoping she'll come back in the fall. Um, we've offered mixed media art through a number of different instructors. We actually had a wonderful sewing instructor who has just started some pretty popular classes before COVID hit. And uh, with everything else, we really want to pump up our arts program because it's really important to the people that take the classes as well too, obviously. We're the city of the arts, but we are very limited on space. 
pre-COVID, we offered a variety of different summer camps. Last year, we did not offer anything with the exception, we'll talk about our, our one virtual camps for drama. These are some of the camps that we offered in the past. Um, this summer, we, uh, from that list, the only camp that we are offering is we are offering youth pottery classes, which are awful. And we are offering uh, tennis camps, which are awful. So the um, tennis camps are fortunately um, taking place at the East Lansing High School Tennis Courts. It's a collaboration with Todd Martin Youth Leadership, and they're fantastic to work with. All of their coaches are well vetted, and um, as I indicated, all of those camps are full for the summer. So that's a pretty exciting partnership for us. One of the also things I oversee is Buddy Basketball. Buddy Basketball, we started in 2007, actually when my youngest was in kindergarten. And it was in response to the fact that we didn't have a theater program for our recreation basketball program. So we were getting a lot of calls from parents wanting to get their kids starting in sports when they're in kindergarten or first grade and we didn't have anything for them at the time. So we started this program. Um, in 2019, we had 149 kids participate. We were doing two groups of uh, four week classes. And unfortunately this year, that number, we had to drop it down again because of COVID restrictions to just 34. So we're hoping um, next year to get our numbers back up again with any luck, but it has been a really popular program. Many of you may have heard of our Sweet Heart Ball. I hope you have, by the way. Um, and I do want to point out to everyone that this is an all-inclusive dance. I know that in many communities offer what is known as a daddy-daughter dance, but we changed our name probably about 10 or 12 years ago just so people would understand that it is meant to be inclusive. And I would say over the last probably six plus years, we have a variety of families that come we have um, moms bringing their sons and daughters. We just have a really wonderful variety. We offer uh, dance, we offer crafts, we offer picture time. Uh, we just try to make it a really fun and special. Lots of food, mostly sugary, delicious treats to wind your kids up for when they go home to bed. Um, Kathleen, <laughs> Kathleen. We, didn't we once have an adult um, woman come with her her dad because they never got the opportunity to do that when she was a child? Yes, yeah, and we've actually had some college girls come too, which I think is kind of neat and fun. <laughs> so, and honestly, for this event, we usually get some sororities that come and lend us a hand with volunteers to help run our craft stations and do different things. And it's a really fun night. Now, the last, this year, we weren't able to do our sweetheart ball. So we said, what else can we do to kind of celebrate Valentine's? So we decided to do Valentine grams. This was our first attempt at doing something like this. And it was pretty successful. So actually, I was delivering cookies and crafts for two days straight. So it was fun and it was different. <laughs> and frankly, um, I must say Mitten Ray's has amazing cookies if you haven't been there. Um, it's, it's worth your time. <laughs> now, this year, we really weren't able to do anything for spring in terms of a spring event either. So we decided to do a Selfies with the Easter Bunny event outdoors. And we thought we would do this pre-registration, and we did. And not a lot of people were pre-registered, so we didn't expect much of a turnout. As it turned out, we had so many people come and they just didn't bother to pre-register. So it was a really nice event. Um, as you can see, we have the Easter Bunny who I didn't realize until looking at this picture how his whites, his face doesn't match his body in terms of whites. But we also may have a surprise guest there next to the Easter Bunny. Thank you very much, Mr. Overby. Um, who <laughs> allowed us to take a picture with the rabbit and him. So that was a really fun event and uh, we were very busy. One of the things that I also oversee is our personal training program. Fitness happens to be like a personal passion of mine. So we started this as a response. Oh my gosh, really a long time ago, um, offering personal training sessions, partially because we have a fitness center here 
and partially since a lot of people really see us as a um, provider of fitness type activities. And so it was just another amenity that we added to our menu of services here at the community center. So this is the recreation arts budget. And what you're seeing here is the budget from 2019, the actual budget, what we budgeted for 2020, and then the actual budget for 2020. Obviously, you can tell that there are some, some changes in the numbers. Uh, the actual FY20 budget really is impacted the last entire quarter. We were closed due to COVID. So that is why you have seen a decline in those numbers. We're hoping that we can bring up some of those numbers, um, but since we really were um, in a situation where we were not able to take in the revenue that we're accustomed to taking in most of this fiscal year, um, fiscal year 21 is not gonna look very great. So I didn't wanna show you any of those numbers yet. <laughs> One of the other things I've um, taken over here recently is overseeing the fitness center. Again, this is a personal passion of mine. So I was really happy to have this opportunity. Um, we have some pretty antiquated equipment that we're hoping to replace in the next few years. Um, but as you can see from some of these photos, these are some of the changes that we made for COVID to try to make people feel safe and more comfortable coming back. I would say that we are ramping back up to pre-COVID participation, but summer is a really hard season to judge because typically as soon as the weather gets nicer outdoors, people just prefer, of course, to be out in beautiful nights like this, riding their bike or jogging or walking instead of indoors. Uh, we will get some people, of course, who when it starts to get really too hot and too muggy, prefer to come inside for their cardio, but right now uh, we are starting to slow down for summer. Kathleen, um, regarding the, the fitness center, I just wanted to make sure to share with, with the commissioners, if you haven't seen the fitness center at the Hannah Community Center, I would encourage you to, to check it out. It, it's not a gold's gym. It's not a, um, you know, I, I can't think off the top of my head, um, some of the other, you know, real large um, fitness centers. It's not the MAC, um, but it really serves a, a niche in our community. The people who use our fitness center really enjoy it. Um, our previous coordinator referred to it as a boutique fitness center. You know, it's, it's smaller, it's intimate. You, you don't have to have, you know, great workout clothes to go and work out. If you're a little overweight and you're running on the treadmill, you don't feel uncomfortable or, or embarrassed. It's a wonderful fitness center for community recreation and for serving our community. So um, we do need to upgrade the equipment some, and that is <laughs> we're going to to be working towards, but um, it's a wonderful community resource at the community center and it's priced accordingly as well. If you're looking at a, a fitness center that's priced economically for your entire family, um, this, this really fits the bill for that. Thank you, Kathleen. No, thanks for pointing that out. I think that's really important. I think we talked about that at some point if you are the type of person who works out three times a week and you're paying $200 a year for uh, the annual membership, you can tell that it becomes very inexpensive for um, to belong to this type of fitness center. So, so let's talk a little and bit. I think we should point out that. Oh, go ahead, because I think no. Kathleen. Yeah, I think we should point out that the infamous Tim McCaffrey works out there as well. <laughs> <laughs> well, and Chuck is a, a, an avid yeah. user, and and I, my the pool access is included in that fee as well. Correct. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. See, that's value for money and, right there. <laughs> and you and use of our gymnasiums when they're available. So it's it and that's similar to the Mac. I mean, people will come in here and use the pool and then go play pickleball indoor for an hour. So there's a really opportunity to do more than just one thing while you're here. So I think it's a great opportunity, but. So all of us express children's theater. I will try not to spend a lot of time on this because I know we talked about it just a couple of months ago. 
Um, in terms of our main stage productions, I'm going to refer to our last full season, which was season 30. And in that season, we had four tremendous shows. Actually, we had the most popular show we've ever done, which was a collaboration with Riverwalk Theater. So we had some adult actors in addition to our youth actors. And we had almost 5,000 people come to our four different productions over the year, which is the most we have ever had in a single season. We had 157 kids in, in our total cast participation, which is the most that we've ever had. And in terms of our crews, we had 216. So just as a reminder to people, we operate with um, the Guild program which means that it, young people who are at part of our theater because young people are both cast and crew members, not adults. And so they participate on various crews like makeup, sets, costumes, props, um, tech, all of those different young people make up our crews. And that is where that 216 number comes. But also those kids have an opportunity then to advance their skill level. And so we actually have apprentice and journeyman and master's programs. And so at the point when a young person gets their master badge, and I'm sorry, I have to call you out again, Pam, because your son and did, and did achieve that. And I think in a several different areas and went on then to assistant direct as well, a show. And so it is a really great opportunity, not only to le learn a lot of different skills, but also to use that on your college application. So yeah, and it, it, it was a wonderful experience for him and it modeled real skills and the, the, there's real work behind the, the badges. And it, I, I think it was real fa really a fantastic thing for him and probably for any kid. Yeah. <laughs> we try to make it a good experience. Yeah, he really enjoyed it. I'm like, he, this is work and he's enjoying it. It, it was, it's a great lesson. <laughs> we typically do a summer show, which is a musical. This is the first summer in a really long time. We won't have a musical. And that is because we didn't want to plan for a musical because we didn't know if we could pull it off. At the time we had to make a decision, it was back in February and we didn't know where COVID would be and we really can't have a singing performance without mics and you can't have mics with COVID. So unfortunately we won't be doing a musical but we will be doing an amazing show this summer. <laughs> so as um, you are aware, we pivoted away from last fall doing in-person shows to doing virtual shows. So we ended up doing three this year. We started out with our double bill performance, which was Snow White. And I'm drawing a complete blank, blank on the other one right now. Um, we did Prince and the Pauper during the winter and then Charlotte's Web this uh, spring. And if you, I'm gonna show you just a small clip from Charlotte's Web. If I can do this, Justin will help me in case I am incapable of doing that. So now I just need to share a different screen. I also put this in the chat. So if somebody is interested in watching the whole thing, you're certainly welcome to do that. So I'm just going to play just about 60 seconds here. Kathleen, I don't hear the audio on that. That's your nasty collection. Now is the yeah. audio on? Yes, thank you. Okay. Sorry. A rat is a rat. But my friends, let's hope that egg never breaks. A rotten egg is a regular stink bomb. Don't worry, I won't break it. I handle stuff like that all the time. I'll put it right over there by the trough, my other things.
Okay, so that was just a little snippet of uh, what the virtual, honestly, I think Charlotte's Web was probably where we really understood how to do a good online performance uh, virtually. And um, I'm super proud of our team. I thought they did an amazing job. And I, this is actually one of my favorite pictures because the kids look so happy and amazed. And I'm, it's because Charlotte was wonderful at making her humble web there. Okay, now I'm not sure why my thing is not advancing. There it goes. Okay. So one of the things that we have also offered through the Children's Theater is our summer drama camps. They are at risk of staying our bread and butter, but because we usually have tremendous att attendance, um, it helps fund our productions the rest of the year. The All the Express Children's Theater is relies very heavily on grants and donations in order to um, meet the expenses that we have that are associated with it. And so when we do our summer drama camps, we are lucky that they contribute towards also that bottom line as well. Pre-COVID, we had 148 kids in a variety of different summer drama camps. Uh, we offer one and two week options, and then each one is, has its own theme and it's kept with a performance. So for example, if your child were to come to a one week camp and it was a Robin Hood, they would work on designing their own script, they would develop their own cast, and then on Friday, they would perform that to their family and friends. We pivoted away from doing that last summer because we couldn't. So what we did instead was virtual drama camps. We were able to offer 10 starting in July with different themes and we ended up with 81 participants. So it ended up being a success after we were really concerned we wouldn't be able to do anything. And again, uh, I, at the risk of repeating myself from the last presentation, this was really due to my amazing staff, but also to the parents who had been involved who said, you can't leave our kids without summer camps. We have to be able to do theater. So this was really our opportunity to keep them involved with theater um, and also keep them interested in our program in general. We did our studio class performance outdoors. So there's kind of a photo of our kids all masked up performing Little Prince out in front of the Hannah Community Center last August because we couldn't be indoors. And then I wanted to include this photo of um, us with some of our team members and obviously Tim with Timothy Busfield. And I'm pretty sure most of this crowd probably knows that actor. He was here in East Lansing a couple of years ago, and he gave us this wonderful idea about theater in the round, which has to do with these next two slides. And he's an East Lansing High School alumnus. <laughs> yeah. And we found out the first time he ever performed um, was on our stage here at the, no, it was in McDonald Middle School, or not McDonald, excuse me, Hannah Middle School at the time, but his very first performance acting gig was here in this building. So that was kind of fun. <laughs> But he gave us that idea that we could, in our big theater, essentially do black box. And so these are two examples that we've done recently where we have done a theater in the round. And here's actually a picture of what it, that looks like. So we essentially use flats in the middle of our current stage and then surround it with chairs. And it gives a very intimate setting for our participants and gives our actors another different experience on how they play to the audience and different skill sets as well. And these are two examples recently of performances that we've done in that style. All of us express children's theater um, budget. This is similar to what I just showed you with Reckon Arts budget in terms of the in FY uh, 2019 actual versus budgeted versus actual for 2020. And again, Numbers, as you can see, were down across the board, but that's because we missed an entire um, quarter from our fiscal year 20. One of the other things that I do is I indicate is oversee the worksite wellness budget. Uh, Kathleen, before you move on to worksite wellness, I want to call out a relationship that um, we have rel related to the All of Us Express Children's Theater, because we frequently hear feedback from individuals asking um, what we do to 
help offset costs or to work with the community to um, raise funds or um, partner with individuals to support our programs in various ways. The All of Us Children's Theater is um, supported immensely by a 501c3 organization that um, assists with fundraising as well as um, provides um, guidance and, and direction in some of the different programmatic aspects of the program. And um, that is a strong relationship and it's something that um, when the city took over the children's theater programming, the, the board supported that and came along with that. And so that's a volunteer board and um, Kathleen, you can share probably a little more about their membership, that sort of thing. But they, they write grants, they have fundraisers, they support the program, not just financially, but um, in other physical ways, a lot of the board members are parents of participants themselves and um, you know provide support to staff so this program could not function the way it does currently without the support of that 501c3 and we have a number of um, relationships like that in some of our different programs and services so as we talk with each of our different coordinators you know you'll hear some other examples of, of ways that we have partnered with local organizations to help us um, serve the, the community um, to the best of our ability. So um, Kathleen, how many members does that board have? I think right now there's eight members. Uh, they, unfortunately their numbers um, ebb and flow like a lot of boards and it does have a lot to do with if their kids age out, a lot of times they age out as well. Um, and that's pretty typical, I think, for youth type programs. Um, but I do thank you for bringing that up because we do have a really incredible group of people that are involved in the board right now who volunteer in a number of capacities, as you indicated. Sometimes they're green room parents. Sometimes they're on the fundraising committee. Um, we have been extremely fortunate um, to get a lot of money and grants. And that is because we have a couple of people on, on that board who write the grants. We as the city do not write them. So it's been a really amazing relationship and uh, we definitely um, are very thankful for that. I'm sorry, why we were still kind of on the theater subject. I couldn't catch Kathleen. Did you say if the summer, the week long summer camps are happening this summer or not? Oh, I'm so sorry. I don't think I did say. I apologize. <laughs> yes, not only are they happening, but they're all full. So, oh, no, I didn't know. <laughs> we, we have a couple where we, at the end of summer, we can still add a few more kids. But... Oh, I didn't hear about them being registered. Oh. My daughter likes souls. She's going to be oh, sad. Oh, wonderful. No, well, we they're full. <laughs> Yeah, we had people asking us in January if we we're going to do them, and at that time we didn't know. Yeah, um, I think we released the information, hoping that we would be where we needed to be with our COVID numbers this summer. Yeah. Um, back in March, and people just started calling. I us missed it. The... Bummer. <laughs> Shoot. She's going to be um, mad. We, <laughs> well, unfortunately, too, we had to go with smaller numbers this year because we weren't sure what our capacities would be. And so, yeah, we are, they are tremendously property uh, popular. We're in our first week of camp right now. And it's been, it's been fun. Okay. <laughs> oh, well, thank asking. you. <laughs> I'm sorry, I missed that. Me too. No. <laughs> So we oversee the worksite wellness program for the city, and it really is a really wonderful opportunity for me, and I'm appreciative of this. We do a variety of different challenges for employees. The bottom line for having a worksite wellness program, of course, the healthier population is, the less you will hopefully be spending on the other end with insurance rates. And so that is the main purpose of why we have a worksite wellness program is to want our employees to have the opportunity to be as healthy as they can. So we offer a variety of different options for them to participate in. So we are at the end of my program. I would say that I wanna give a special attention to the different organizations that we work with, um, the Arts Council, Capital Region Community Foundation, Michigan Council for the Arts, 
because I have a picture of a soundboard there. Um, we have written grants to do improvements in our theater. So thanks to the Michigan Council of the Arts and our capital improvement projects, we've been able to spend, I think we're close to about $200,000 what we spent in updating some of our technical equipment and our lights in the theater, which is very important because as I'm sure most of you know, that stuff ages out very quickly. And uh, we're gonna continue to work on in making those improvements because they not only benef benefit our children's see, but they benefit all of our rentals as well. So I just wanted to say, please follow us on our different um, platforms. And if there's any questions, I'm happy to take them. Otherwise, I wish you all a very wonderful night. Well, I'd like to kick off by saying extreme kudos to Kathleen in particular, but the staff in general for navigating through the pandemic. I was so impressed with the ongoing communication, the ideas that fostered the activities, even in the lockdown. And I, I'm, I'm real impressed with the way the East Lansing staff rose to the occasion. And particularly with the arts and and athletics being such a touch point for so many people in the city. Anyway, kudos again. Um, I guess my, my, I do have a question or an observation. There's no interaction with primetime seniors really, is there? Because there seems like there's some overlapping offers. And I could, you know, I look at the, the gym facilities, I think, well, that would be ideal for seniors, you know, the dedicated, um, athletic training and stuff could be so useful. What I would say about that is primetime is still on hiatus from COVID. I believe they're expected to return now to the regular programming in the fall. But yes, there has definitely been some overlap in my tenure here with the city. I sort of view it as in recreation and arts programming is all ages and primetime likes to focus on um, seniors basically. Seniors, yeah. Um, their program also is pretty much ends at four o'clock every single day. Uh, so if you are a person who like I'm in my fifties now and I technically could participate in their programs, but I work, work. until, you know, yeah. the same with all, probably all of you here too, that I can't go to a yoga class at three o'clock. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. we, we, that's why we get a lot of adults in our um, older adults, and I guess I'm sort of middle-aged in there, but it, the, we have all ages. Let's just say. Yeah, that. that's, that's what I've seen is all ages participating, the ceramics and everything. Any yeah. other comments? Kathleen, I just want to thank you. All of these programs require a boatload of planning mm -hmm. and managing and coordination and planning and managing and coordination all over again for every yeah, single so. one and you've done a great job, thank you. Thank you, I appreciate that. Thank you for, for saying that, Chuck. Um, Kathleen and, and her staff and a number of other staff in, in our department, um, COVID has been rough for, for everyone. And, and I think, you know, our joke was, has, has been for months now, well, I'm replanning, you know, yeah, yeah. And then you replan, then you replan, you replan and, you know, and, and you just get something laid out and the rules will change and you're pivoting again. And so um, it has been, I, you know, Kathleen and her crew has done an amazing job of that and that just continual planning and doing things in a new way that we haven't done before. Um, you know, when, when you have a lot on your plate, you start to rely on, on, you know, existing practices. It's like, okay, I've done this before. I can pull that out and kind of repeat it. Well, everything has been new. And so that then takes more energy and more time and thought and, and whatnot. So, um, you know, Oh, and and it's great from the standpoint that sometimes it's good to to look at things with new eyes, but it is a lot more work. Challenging. Oh, so, um, a lot more challenging. And so I I really have to you know give give kudos to all of our staff for hanging in there and just continuing to to repeat each day. Um, sometimes what they did the day before. <laughs> <laughs> you guys all have a wonderful night. Thank you, you so too. much. Thank you, Kathleen. All right.
So now we're moving on to the selection of commissioners to be on the interview panel. I would like to be on the interview panel. I'm going to offer that to Chuck as the vice chair. Are you interested in being on the interview panel? I am. I, I would like to have some discussion on time and 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 what it would require of us. But yes, I am interested. Okay. And so, is there some another member or a number of members of the board that would like to participate? Come on, somebody raise your hands. Nicole. <laughs> I, I I could I mean I guess I would be interested in there. Yeah, it's not mandated. So so yeah we'll yeah get, yeah I mean we'll, I I would participate or I would be happy to give you and Chuck just like, <laughs> like so, so please be sure to ask them this yeah 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 excellent either way however that works and so moving Wendy or Jane whoever that's that this is the three and then we'll find out Chuck what the commitment looks like and. And nobody has to do it, but this is, you know, but they don't want per ELI. So I, you know, um, George did not say this, but that they don't want a quorum to make, to make it. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. so I, that's I, why I mean, the limited number, but. I'd be, I'd you know, be happy with just, you know, giving you all like more experienced ones. Like, yeah. you know, the. I don't, the, I don't the think lead. we're getting to ask questions. I think we're just oh. getting to observe. That's my, that's my, that was okay. what I thought I heard George say. So. Oh, all right. Well, I, I guess I would be happy if, if I could like send your way just things I hope you observe. Right on. <laughs> I that. And, okay. and I will forward those on to George because that is definitely, uh, that's the kind of input. So I mean, you notice we got, we all got a, um, the, the job description. And I want to say again, if anyone knows anyone who might be a good candidate, think about reaching out to them and suggesting they apply because that is I, straightforwardly women and frequently people of color want to be invited to know they're welcome. And it's a whole different mindset sometimes, but so we'll see. So, but think about reaching out to kudos to anybody you know that this is a neat job, neat town. Think about it. Um, I was just going to offer if if there's any reason to have an alternate with the scheduling that you can right on. We'll add your name to the list. <laughs> <an alternate>. <laughs> you. sure. And I think depending on how the process ends up working out, we could three could this three could go, this three could go. I think it just can't be more than three at the same time in the same yeah. place. I, I think you guys may be able to ask questions if it's similar to the format for the police chief, if it's going to oh. be that kind of multi-room, multi-panel uh, kind of thing where the candidates move around to different oh, rooms. I, yeah, you might want to prepare a group, a set of questions and send them to George that, that could be integrated into the questions. You, they were predetermined, but you were able to ask them in your own fashion uh, well, for, thanks, the, for the police. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. And I want to say one of the things just as an observation, citizen observation, people, and when Ron was interviewed and when the candidates were interviewed for um, the city council spaces, they were all asked identical questions. I'm not sure if George is gonna do that this time, but there is a reason to do that. It's a fairness reason and a, a comparative, you're able to do side-by-side -side comparison. So I had a lot of people are like, why are they asking everybody the same question? And, and that sort of thing. So you may see that in this process as well, but that is, it is intentional and it is so you have a fairness model where everyone is being asked to answer the same, same series of questions. Nicole, I'm unclear on if you're in or out. I didn't, I didn't catch that. Uh, if there's like, a, <laughs> yeah, and like, I, there's a limited number and like, there's like three of you who've like been doing this more and like, that's great. I mean, if if you would need me, that I would. But um, sure, yeah, yeah. yeah. We'll, we'll we'll keep the communication open, and we'll make sure four of us don't ever show up at the same. <laughs> the, reason, the reason I ask that is that our absent our absent commissioner Adam Delay may have some interest, and sure. I don't know how, how that would fit in with your interest, Nicole. So that's what I was trying to. Piece. I mean, you you all know like my big interest, and I would be very I'd very much want to know like how much the person is um devoted to sort of like ecological issues and awareness so i mean i think that would be pretty central especially like as we're you know very fortunate here in michigan in terms of the impacts of climate change but 
you know, we can, we, we certainly need to have a, a proactive mindset. So I'd be interested. I in prioritization. Yeah, thank you. I like that. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think that's a good idea to even send that forward to Georgia as a question around two or three things. I mean, it's such a broad job. You know, I don't know. I don't really think you get everything in one person anyhow. It's very difficult for all the responsibilities. So, you know, if you're thinking they have um, responsibilities to infrastructure, responsibilities to programming, responsibilities to, I mean, just budget, like all these things. So I, that, that um, kind of ecology question might be a good question if you wanted that incorporated sure into the question. Yeah, sure. yeah. Pam, Pam, I love your word, prioritization. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and, and that's a concern that I had, and I've been chatting with some people about that, that it's not necessarily a traditional situation when the parks and rec director is also covering all capital improvements and in infrastructure. So I'm a little concerned of trying to find a candidate that has that sort of background. Yeah. Because that is, Ron, you got something? Yeah, like I, I think it's really important that you guys think that through, like, um, kind of project out over 10 years and that kind of thing and really give your input into what you think what you want out of that role um you know what all the things that were done well things that hey if, if someone had these abilities i think it's important to hear from you guys really 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 important for the future and kind of which direction um this could go because i you're just not going to get a, a, this administrator and maybe someone who's great at programming and some you know like a, I think you're going to get some of each thing, you know, and they'll have strengths and weaknesses. So if you, if you guys prioritize and maybe let George know, this is what you think are the priorities for Parks and Rec long-term. Uh, I think that's important to hear from you guys. So I've got a question on the semantics of that. How do we, we can't have another quorum and I'm kind of confused about board communication you know, in terms of how would we transmit that information? Individual <sighs> letters to George? I mean, that is what he requested. I, and, I think and, so, to, to avoid table talk and yeah, uh, kind yeah. of non-public communication. Yeah, you'd yeah. have to do it without any, you know, collusion or correspondence. Yeah, but no, I, what, I, I think you guys know know what you want and what's right. important. Uh, yeah. and, I, and I do, I have vetted something that I have done on a number of occasions a communication can one way communication can be sent and then request made to add two minutes to the agenda mm -hmm. of the next meeting. So that, so if someone, I would suggest that if you're sending a, a letter to George, you request or include it in your, in your board comments and have it included in, in the, in the agenda or in the minutes of the meeting, the next meeting. So that's, that just gets it out there public that we can all discuss it as a board comment item and, yeah, you're right. It could be put in written correspondence in your next agenda. That's a good yeah, idea. That's a way to share it with, with the, the board, and then we can all discuss once in a meeting once we're all together. All righty. Staff communication. Acting director report, as it's come to be known. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, um, Chair. In your packet, I believe, um, was forwarded to you sort of bullet, a bulleted list of um, some different things that I wanted to, to update each of you on in terms of the progress that we've made on things over the next uh, or the, over the past month. Um, the first thing is where we're at with the vending and food trucks in city parks. Um, we have forwarded the draft um, policy or draft procedure to the city manager's office for, for review. And we also have had that reviewed by our planning department. And some of the initial feedback that we received is that there is some concern about um, setting up some sort of practice for vending in Valley Court Park because that is within the DDA and the DDA has historically had some concerns with food vendors um, in the DDA. And so what we're looking at at this point in time is because we wanna get 
something moving forward and we want to try this out and see if there's an interest, what we have suggested is that we just look at Patriarch Park. Um, and so then that that's our biggest park. It's our park with the best use. Um, it's the park where we've already had um, a, a vendor, not a food truck vendor, but we've had an ice cream vendor approach us, you know, with an interest. So what we're looking to do is, is move forward with revising that um, um, policy a little bit and just focusing on Patriarch Park and then moving that through the process. So hopefully we'll We'll be able to update you at your next meeting with a final policy and let you know where where we're moving with that um, that um, program. So that's where we're at there. Ron, do you have a comment? A question, um, mm -hmm. Wendy. How do, how does that apply to the um, prepared food vendors for like farmers market and things like that? Does that not fall under? that this word we're, we're looking at this particular program that we're looking at is a program that is not city sponsored so the farmers market is city sponsored and so we organize having the vendor there what we're looking at is giving food vendors and other vendors the opportunity to come as um, individual food providers into a public setting and so they would um, apply for, I don't know if we refer to it as the license or a permit, but they'd apply for permission and they'd be assigned a space and a certain time that they can be there. And um, just to see, you know, if there's enough interest uh, in um, offering that service to those who visit our parks. I got it. Okay. So like a food truck rally, like that you hear about that kind of thing where it'd be driven by the food truck providers versus us is the difference. Yes. Okay, yes. perfect. Yeah. Sarah, you. did you have something? No. Sarah, did you have something? Oh, uh, just a question. So there was also some discussion of doing the play in the park events at Patriarch and that there might be uh, possibly seeking out a vendor associated with that. Is that still a possibility for this summer? Um, Justin actually is um, also in charge of the various community events. And so Justin, if you could share a little bit what we have planned for play in the park. I know we do have one play in the park plan for Patriarch, but in terms of what is involved in that, um, Justin, if you could share. I um can tell you that it, we've got some dates picked out. We're working on recruiting performers and getting that squared away first. Um, I'm also trying to get through the Jazz Festival next week. And once I get through that next weekend, then the July and August programming will be front and center. So in, in two weeks, I'll, I'll have way more uh, energy to dedicate to, to getting that done. But it will be at Patriarch Park. We've got some dates that we're nearing to get finalized. Once we get contracts done, then we'll get a, an announcement out. And actually, thank you, Justin, for bringing that up. It's not on the staff report, but the Jazz Festival is coming up um, next weekend, Justin. Yep. So the all of the performances will be live streamed. Um, so you will be able to tune in Friday, Saturday, and Sunday next weekend um, on both YouTube and Facebook, um, simulcast on both platforms to be able to enjoy 18 state and local jazz artists over the course of the weekend. Uh, there's a lot of really cool music that we're looking forward to. Um, so it's going to be a pretty cool, pretty cool thing. Super. Thank you. Um, any other um, questions on the vending food trucks and city parks before I move on? Okay, super. Um, next, we just wanted to share with you a letter that was transmitted um, regarding the Fine Park Community Garden. It went to Nicole, actually, in her role as working on that project with the Pinecrest Elementary School, as well as the, the Pinecrest neighborhood. Um, we have... Um, We've indicated in the letter that um, if a community garden is installed on school property that they're welcome to use the water from the existing water source in the park, um, at least for this first year and then depending on, on what the use numbers are, usage levels are like we, we kind of um, reserve the right to have some discussion about some sort of cost share in the future, but we want to make sure to offer support for that project in that garden as it as it moves forward. 
Um, you heard the um, comments from Ann Hill regarding yard waste in the Sanderson drain. We did communicate um, with her and based on her feedback, we also, you know, will look into some alternative methods of communicating with some of the residents that um, are, are most logically the ones who are contributing to this problem. You know, we really don't have any way of knowing where this yard waste is coming from. It just kind of makes sense based on its location. And so we'll look a little further into what our options are with, with communicating um, with some of those residents. I did share with you the applicable ordinance just in case anybody is interested in reading ordinance language on rubbish and yard waste. Um, if you have a little bit of a lack of, if you have trouble falling asleep tonight. Can um, I ask, I've got a question. What, sure. what is the city's relationship with homeowners associations? Is there, is there a relationship? It seems like they'd be at some natural liaison activity yeah. going. Yeah, um, actually the city in general, I think has very positive relationships with the homeowners association. We have a program where there are a number of staff in the city organization that actually serve as liaisons to the different homeowners associations. And those individuals will attend homeowners association meetings, um, answer any um, questions related to city structure or organization, um, serve as a liaison back and forth between the city and the homeowners Association. And I actually used to be the liaison with the Hawkness Homeowners Association. And um, their meeting um, times changed. So they actually generally meet at the same time that the advisory commission does. So I wasn't able to continue that. So I now um, liaise with the White Hills um, Neighborhood Association and Homeowners Association, and one of the other city staff is with the Hawk Nest. So generally we have very good relationships and um, that's why, um, you know, Commissioner Hoover, when you raised this as an idea, I thought it, it was an excellent means of communicating with, with the residents. Um, but I understand where, where Ann Hill is coming from as well. And I think she needs to, um, you know, she, she w lives in that community. And so she needs to think about um, the messages that she sends um, in the newsletters and, and how that, that could be perceived by her neighbors. And so, um, you know, but, but generally um, we, we have great support from the homeowners associations in communicating with the residents in the neighborhoods. Did that answer your question? Okay. Yes, yeah, it did. I just wanted to kind of get that on the record. I know, you know, I know we've been doing liaisoning and you guys attend meetings, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, fees for services, I just wanted to let the commission know that um, city, you had raised some questions in the budget process when we talked about um, fees in particular fees for our childcare programs and some of our other programs. And you had raised the idea of potentially looking at some sort of sliding scale for fees or um, you know, some sort of tiered um, assessment of fees. City council has also raised that idea and I just wanted to share with you that um, staff will be developing a, a process over the next couple of months where we define how we're going to evaluate doing that because there are impacts to both revenue as well as potential impacts to participation levels. And, you know, it's, it's, it's not a simple um, thing to completely revise our, our fee structure. And don't forget administrative overhead. Administrative that, overhead. That. So, but we do want to really give consideration to that because um, I think there could be a lot of value to, to different people, especially when you look at, um, you know, opening up our programs and services to the widest range of individuals. Um, and so we will be looking into that and we'll report, be reporting back to you and let you know the, the progress we're making and, and what we're thinking we may be able to recommend for implementing. So just to let you know that hasn't fallen off the radar and we'll be working on that over the next few months. Um, water fountains in parks, we've turned them on. 
just so everybody knows, if you are in a park and one is not working, please let me know because it's probably broken. So <laughs> there's now water sources in the parks. Um, the East Lansing Softball Complex Dugout Shelters. I wanted to update everybody on this because uh, we recently put in these, these great new dugouts and shelters and they failed almost as soon as we put them in. So we have been working with our designer, our contractor, as well as the material supplier. And we have come up with a remedy for how we can fix those so that they function for us. And we will be working at implementing that over the next probably, hopefully two weeks, but it might be more like four or five weeks, depending on material supplies, et cetera. So that was just one of those things that sometimes happens in construction projects. We have haven't, we haven't done shelters before. And um, so we, we have learned a lot of good lessons. And I just wanted to let everybody know that we're aware there's an issue and we're working towards fixing that. Wendy, are the, is, this a, is this a full structural issue? Or is this a flooding issue? Or what's happening with the dugouts? Well, what's happening is we, we put shade structures in um, but the shade structures just didn't work. The, the fabric was drooping. They, they ripped off the, you know, the grommets that was holding them in place. Um, water collected in them instead of running off. So yeah. there were, yeah, just a number, yeah, a number of things. So it's not a safety issue at all. It's just not functioning and we want to correct that so that they function the way they should. Sarah Hoover, did you have a comment? No, I guess I was going to ask the same thing because I, we spend a lot of time there. And I, as far as shade, it totally does the trick. I mean, it's cover over the kids' heads. So we're appreciative of that. But I, I could tell I, it almost reminded me of a shower curtain. You know, they almost <laughs> kind of <laughs> turn into ripples. Um, but And I thought, wow, that can't drain well. But fortunately, we haven't been there when we've had heavy rain. So um, I, I'm glad it's being fixed. But I appreciate that they're even out there to begin with. So thank you. Well, thank you. We do have to, to go with a little bit of a different type of fabric. So I'm hopeful it still provides the, the amount of shade that's necessary, but we're looking at a combination of a change in fabric as well as, as increasing the support, um, the support members. And hopefully, you know, we'll be able to, to get that taken care of. Like I said, it's one of those learning experiences. So um, our farmer's market opened two weekends ago to great success. We've had a lot of real positive feedback, um, great attendance. The first market was quite warm. Um, the market last weekend was much more comfortable. Um, and so we're just excited to, to be back operating and have that season um, moving forward again. And then, you, yes. I feel like I have a question for everything right yeah. now. I'm sorry. Yeah, no worries. That's wonderful. <laughs> um, question on the market as far as the, the number of vendors and those types of things post COVID, did things come back to normal? Did we see a downturn or an upswing coming out with the vendors? Um, I believe we are pretty much back to normal. Um, we typically have each year, there's a limited number of spots and we typically have more people apply than we have spots for. And we have to go through a process of um, um, evaluating and choosing and so that we have a good variety of vendors. Um, I think we had a, a little bit, a few less applicants, but we still had enough to fill the spots. And I believe we also had to, to whittle that down some as well. So, um, We've, we've got a, a great list of vendors. Um, the fish person came back this year. Everybody likes the fish guy. And, um, you know, and then we have some, some new vendors and some um, real neat different kinds of foods. We've really been focusing at trying to diversify what we offer at the market as well. Um, Carla um, Forrest Hewitt is our, our staff person who really um, is the lead staff person on that project. And she's been working really hard at trying to get a kind of a wider variety of vendors there. And so hopefully if you have visited the market in the past and visited this year, you'll, you'll see that um, in person. I, I wanna make a little plug for um our neighbors, the east side of Lansing, Allen Street Center is looking to open up an Elfco, which is the old East, 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 
East Lansing Food Co-op, but it, now it's going to be the East Side Lansing Food Co-op. And, you know, they're looking for support and they're three minutes from East Lansing. And it, I'm excited. I'm looking forward to having a, another food co-op back like Wolf Moon and just wanted to put that out there for everybody. Okay, and then one final thing, unless anybody has other things that they'd like an update on, and that is there's some information in your packet on the State Parks American Rescue Plan. Basically what this is, is our governor announced that there is um, going to be some increase in funding to our state parks, um, $250 million in federal funding going to our state parks. And this is um, super exciting for the state parks, but it's also exciting for local parks in that we believe that what this means is there is likely to be a reprioritization of some of the natural resources trust fund dollars to give some additional funding opportunities to um, local agencies. The Natural Resources Trust Fund is the primary funding source that we use for a lot of our capital projects here in the city. And we've been very successful and have you know, really received millions of dollars over the years in funding from that source. But it always is highly competitive. And um, uh, some of that is because some of those funds also go towards state parks. So if state parks have increased funding and from a different source, then there potentially will be some reprioritization for local projects. And so um, I wanted to share this information with you so that you were aware of, of that happening and let you know that we will be continuing to track this and we'll keep you updated if, um, if indeed it does appear like there'll be greater funding opportunities for us locally. And that is all I have at this time. All right, time for commissioner communication. Alex, do you have anything? Nothing this month, thank you. Sarah Hoover? I'm all set, thanks. Nicole? Yeah, I wanna thank the, Wendy helped a lot. We have a oh, Pinecrest you. Neighborhood Association. We have a Juneteenth event coming up Saturday, Juneteenth. It starts yes. at 2 p.m. Everyone, please come. You're all invited, of course. But, um. Parks and Rec, it helped uh, bring us picnic tables, um, forgave our tardiness and getting permission for amplification because we, will, we do have an open mic component to it and also some performers. Here's Melissa. Back up, sweetie. So yeah, just thankful for all that help. And uh, again, um, hold on, Mosey. Um, yeah, I want to encourage people to come. Uh, we're meeting at the Pinecrest sign at um, Harrison and Crown at 2 p.m. and doing a little march, solidarity march through the, the neighborhood and ending up at Henry Fine Park. And yeah, we have some performances this year and everything, so it should be fun. So thank you for your help. Great. Sarah R? Nope. Thanks, everybody. I'm good. Chuck? I do have a comment. I, I want to thank Sarah Hoover for her efforts to help us address the issues along the, the, the Northern Tier Trail. I really appreciate it. But I also want to point out, and I, I think it can speak for the, for the commission, that we support and value input from all of our citizens, even when they don't agree with us, even when, when there are differences, we are glad to discuss those differences. And that input to us is valuable across the board and we want to encourage and, and support that input from the community. Yeah, here, here, Chuck. All right, Ron, is there anything you wanna say? Yeah, I'll represent Adam here because I was running late. We actually had football again, so I had football practice So at Hazlitt, so we were, I was late today. Sorry about that. Um, Adam, uh, myself, Elaine, and Karen Honey on the project for Robert L. Green. Um, the, the really heavy paperwork lift that Adam did uh, for state approval for the marker on Parkland uh, has been approved by the state. What? Um, yeah, so moving forward with very fast, very thorough job. Um, moving forward, um, some questions on the verbiage and that type of thing and finalizing the broadness or narrowness of the verbiage will be the final step. And then in, into manufacturing, we're shooting for the August timeline as this is turned into kind of a multi-phase uh, project working with um, our, our goal to rename a public school, 
Uh, the goal are now around uh, one of the mural projects being dedicated to the civil rights movement in East Lansing. And, um, and then in communication with Michigan State around some things for Dr. Green at Michigan State as, the, as kind of the final step. Uh, all those things are in motion um, on all sides and looking good. We were shooting for a target date uh, in August, but that's just to keep pressure on the situation. Um, that we can't control the manufacturing. There's some delays in manufacturing of these, those uh, metal signs that come out of Ohio and there's a single source for those. And of course, like everything else, it's been delayed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that may, that may, may make us miss that mark, but we, we, if, if we have those, um, the people in town to do any other portion of it, we will do a ribbon cutting and a dedication of future site, that kind of thing. Um, hopefully um, everything aligns. It's very with that many different, things moving at one time it's going to be very difficult to align it around one date but it's exciting how rapidly uh, this has moved forward so I wanted to congratulate Adam's portion of that heavy lift on paperwork and historical archiving and all that kind of stuff it was amazing work so yeah, he, he was a real driver yeah yeah, yeah. absolutely drove it. Are, you, are you guys working with the arts commission for the mural the mural, I believe so, and Wendy may know even better than me. That that was like new news to me, maybe even a couple of weeks ago. So I, I wasn't, I wasn't even privy to that. Like that went right around me, <laughs> but I was excited for it. And I was, I wasn't sure that they were um, sort of um, announcing or making public um, the the mural design, and so that's why I haven't shared much. But the most recent mural that the Art Commission currently is um, working with an artist on is um, planned to be installed um, on the big gray wall. Um, oh shoot, you know the the building where Target is located. Um, all of those buildings sort of seem to have the name like city center in them. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. never sure what's what. So um, the building where, where Target is, there's a big gray wall that faces uh, Pinball Pete's and, and the Riv. On the bottom of it is a black and white, um, but real colorful mural. And then at the top, there's still a big uh, blank gray spot. Um, the Art Commission is currently finalizing the design for a mural there. And a central feature of that mural is um, Robert L. Green. And wow. um, the the artist, the the name I'm not remembering and, and I probably would would um, grossly mispronounce it anyway. So um, I can forward you that information in, in writing. But the the artist is is really known for these incredibly graphic and vibrant um, um, art displays. And so this, this mural is really coming together to, to be very beautiful and striking. And um, Dr. Green is, is, a, is a primary um, focus of that design. So um, the, the hope had been initially that that mural would be installed um, so that it could be kind of unveiled or dedicated during the art fest. We're having a little bit of challenges with um, figuring out how to get equipment onto the site that's high enough so that the mural can be painted. And so we're not sure we're going to be able to hit that that August deadline, but that's still our goal right now. Yeah, that was on the consent agenda. It, it did come off the consent agenda, so I assume I did, they didn't explain exactly uh, what the discrepancy was, but I figured it was logistics. So. And, and that's exactly what it is. It's, uh, we're trying to decide, do we have to come over to, onto the wall over the top? Can we come up from the bottom? Do we need easements? You know, so there's, again, a lot of moving parts there logistically we're trying to work through. Yeah, and I didn't know I jumped the gun. I apologize, Wendy, if I jumped the gun on anything. I thought I was late with that. <laughs> no, no, you didn't. That's great. Um, that, that is no problem. Well, and I just know that there's some funds in the Arts Commission. That's why, that's why I brought it up, that if they weren't, if somebody else was working over here, that FYI, there might be some funds available mm -hmm. over here. So. All right. I don't really have anything in addition. Oh, Nicole? Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm, I just want to mention that at Juneteenth, I had spoken with Elaine, and uh, hopefully Ron will do it too, but uh, she's interested in a table to have information there about Dr. Green. So that'll, that'll be a nice opportunity for that. And Pam, I want to mention you, Amelda Hay is one of our performers. So oh, are you and Blake? <laughs> and Natawa's in town. So 
yeah. I hope oh, I'll, I'll, let, I'll let Blake yeah. go. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> Moses, we already did public comment. Okay. So I think that's everything, unless someone has anything else. Would someone like to move to adjourn? So moved. Seconded. All right. We got Alex to second, I think. Ron, did you have something else? No, I'm done. Okay. <laughs> We're all done then. All right. Bye, everybody. Bye, We're adjourned. Bye-bye. Here.